it's a little bit uh, of the brief about the conference. Of course, you all have uh, seen it, but uh, uh, so this is a part of UKD projects, uh, which is uh, between me and uh, David Werner uh, of Newcastle University. And uh, so the, they, in that project, we have mandated to organize a workshop, uh, two workshops every uh, each year. I mean, the, um, and this conference now have the five plus countries uh, representative, uh, either a speaker, uh, I mean the speaker, 10 teams, 200 plus participants has been registered officially and uh, until yesterday morning and uh, 30 plus guest speaker are uh, there. Um, we have chosen these uh, themes and uh, of course, you know, now we are in the second day, first theme, uh, contaminant transport and remediation. And here we are going to have five uh, star speakers that we are uh, going to have. Um, of course, there was uh, yesterday, uh, we had the, uh, Dr. Rakesh Kumar as a CSIR Navy director for a um, inaugural talk and we had a COVID uh, uh, theme uh, between these uh, people who are uh, extensively working on COVID. Uh, and uh, then uh, they, we tried to work on geogenic concerns and person and other uh, people have also came uh, and given the talk. So this is the today's uh, one. Of course, um, the, all the participants, even a speaker can stay for the another thing because we are not taking any break and entire uh, in four hours we will be here. Um, so uh, without uh, much, um, and they, we are today uh, touching on microbiological water quality and the public health and conflicts. Here we have the people from UNICEF, uh, Gujarat Pollution Control Board, uh, David himself will present. Um, and then uh, there is a last but not the least on the climate change. So this is the today's agenda. Um, so let me start without any, uh, let me for uh, our attendees, uh, I just want to say that this is a one uh, hour theme. And uh, in this theme, all the speaker will be invited to give their experience here, their experience first for seven to 10 minutes and then we will move to the panel discussion. Please give your Q&A. Uh, we will answer it uh, later or even uh, the, within a week, uh, but I will pick up if there will be many interesting, uh, interesting questions. Otherwise, uh, I have some questions already framed for this uh, really good experienced uh, researcher. So without uh, further ado, uh, I, it is my, uh, how to say that this is, I keep on inviting uh, Devendu Da or Professor Sarkar uh, to uh, the several times that please come and give a um, talk, but somehow this time I could catch hold of him and thank you very much uh, for accepting this, uh, the invitation. He is a professor of environmental engineering at uh, uh, the Stevens Institute uh, Te of Technology, New Jersey, USA. Uh, but he is really a um, Bengali by heart he, because of his training. He, was, uh, he did his uh, master degree in geology and we are earth science department from University of Calcutta. However, his PhD in geochemistry, which uh, the hydrogeochemistry is my, uh, uh, the area of uh, domain that where I work uh, from the University of Tennessee. He has guided uh, 12 PhD student. He is the fellow of GSA, which is really prestigious and also the Soil Society of America. Um, he has been uh, heavily engaged in editorial activities for his professional societies. He is editor-in-chief of uh, Springer's current pollution report, uh, which has more than th three impact factor. And he has been technical editor for environmental science and technology, associate editor of Ulysses GeoHealth and Elsevier's environmental technology and innovation. Um, it is our honor to host you, Professor Sarkar, and now floor is yours. All right, thanks, uh, Manish. Can you sh see my screen? Yeah, yeah, fully. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as uh, Manish mentioned, I'm a professor of uh, environmental engineering at Stevens Institute of Technology, uh, uh, which is in New Jersey. It's uh, very early in the morning here, so please forgive me if I fall asleep during the session. Uh, I'm also the founding director of the Sustainability Management uh, Graduate Program here, and uh, my research group is the Environmental Sustainability Lab. Uh, uh, Manish asked me to give a brief overview of the kind of research that's going on uh, uh, in my group. So that's where I will start. Uh, so research in my group uh, reflects my firm belief in a holistic multidisciplinary framework for developing a sustainable environment. My approach is from the angle of uh, environmental system sciences, 
that requires the applications of geochemical, hydrological, and engineering principles in solving issues related to environmental quality and its ultimate effect on ecosystem and human health. Uh, I'm a broadly trained soil and water chemist. Uh, most of uh, the research in my group applies to geochemical and biogeochemical principles in uh, addressing environmental quality and remediation issues. Uh, we evaluate field greenhouse and experimental data, both macroscopic and microscopic to investigate human bioavailability, aqueous and solid phase speciation, dissolution, mineralization, precipitation and adsorption mechanisms of both organic and inorganic chemicals in soil, water and sediments. Uh, most of uh, them result in estimation of ecological and human health risk for environmental decision making. Um, many of my recent uh, research projects are geared towards uh, developing a sustainable environment uh, till technologies uh, following the circular economy principle. I'll talk about a couple of these projects in the next few slides. In some cases, uh, 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 we uh, use plants and microbes to uh, remove water and soil contaminants. And in some other cases, uh, we repurpose waste materials to develop remediation technologies. These are quote unquote green technologies because we give the waste products a second life. And uh, they are also green because uh, they are inexpensive and easy to use. Uh, we have uh, pretty robust analytical facilities in ESL. We are capable of doing all sorts of chemical analysis, uh, uh, including hard to analyze species such as those of P4 and PFOS. Uh, we can also do mineralogical analysis, microscopic analysis, and molecular biology analysis. Uh, here's a list of uh, our ongoing projects. Sorry for the very busy slide. Uh, my student, uh, Viravid, is working on developing green technologies to remove both legacy and emerging contaminants from stormwater runoff and wastewater systems. I'll very, very briefly talk about his projects in the next two slides. Uh, in one of these projects, uh, Viravid is using a hyperaccumulating plant species. Another PhD student, uh, Samir, is reusing the plant spent biomass from that project to generate bioenergy in the form of ethanol and biochar. We are uh, reusing the biochar to remove pollutants from stormwater runoff. Uh, my student, Roxana, is developing a net zero technology for sustainable reclamation of wastewater in a army munition manufacturing plant. We are degrading the energetics to inorganic nitrogen species that is providing nutrients for uh, plant growth that we are using as a biodiesel feedstock. My postdoc, uh, Jiming, is field implementing a chemically catalyzed phytoremediation model uh, that we developed earlier in uh, residential and brownfield properties in two cities in the US, uh, one in Jersey City here in New Jersey and the other one in San Antonio in Texas. In another project, we are using ferret, which is a high valence iron species to defluorinate freon 113, which is a chlorofluorocarbon in a groundwater plume. During this redox process, ferret reduces to ferric, which precipitates as rust and takes out arsenic via adsorption. The last project, which uh, is probably not uh, very relevant to the climate change theme, uh, uh, I'm working with one of my former PhD students, who is now a faculty member in a tribal university in New Mexico, to reclaim acid mine drainage impacted coal mine sites in the Navajo Nation. Uh, this is Viravid's first project. Uh, very briefly, we have taken an industrial waste, uh, the sludge that is produced in uh, drinking water treatment plants that use alum or iron salts as coagulants and processed it uh, to concentrate the reactive fractions. We then coated regular wood mulch uh, using a patent pending process to generate what we call a green engineered mulch. This green mulch can replace regular mulch uh, in roadside extended tree pits or bioretention cells, which receive high inputs of stormwater uh, with contaminants like uh, petroleum hydrocarbons, phosphorus, copper, lead, zinc, cadmium, nickel. Uh, the green mulch adsorbs the contaminants, giving the 
existing green infrastructures a layer of pollution protection. We are currently field implementing uh, this technology in a rain garden in Sikaukas Township, which is, which is a neighboring township to Hoboken where I live. Uh, here's another example of how we are repurposing drinking water treatment residuals for stormwater filtration in this project, which was Viravid's master's thesis project. We generated a granular filter media using a patented process and used them to retrofit catch basin inserts in stormwater drains or manholes, which are typical gray infrastructures. Uh, the filter media was capable of removing typical stormwater contaminants like uh, sediments, uh, hydrocarbons, and metals, uh, but did not prevent stormwater flow because of its granular form. So it was a perfect trade-off between hydraulics and contaminant removal capacity. Uh, this is Samir's PhD dissertation. We are using a plant uh, with a huge uh, dense root system called vetiver to remove legacy contaminants like nitrogen and phosphorus, as well as emerging contaminants like antibiotics from wastewater by retrofitting constructed wetlands with floating treatment platforms. We have shown that vetiver is a hyper accumulator of uh, nutrients and antibiotics like tetracycline and ciprofloxacin. Uh, we are using the spent biomass after wetlands treatment and generating ethanol uh, uh, from the aerial parts and biochar from vetiver roots following circular economy principles. This is Jiming's project. Uh, we are using phytotechnology to remove lead contamination in urban soils. Uh, although lead-based paints were uh, uh, banned in the United States way back in 1978, there are still a large number of houses in all major cities in the US that have old uh, lead-based paints Weathering of pens result in high lead concentrations in residential yard soils. Uh, uh, this uh, lead contaminated soil is tracked inside the houses as dust. And this is the primary exposure route for uh, lead in residential properties. A soil lead survey that we conducted in San Antonio, uh, Texas, showed that uh, lead concentration could reach as high as uh, 15,000 parts per million, which is almost 40 times higher than the US EPA soil cleanup limit of 400 parts per million. So phytoremediation has proven to be an inexpensive and environment friendly technology for lead cleanup, but the efficiency of course depends on the existing forms of soil lead. Plants can extract soluble and exchangeable forms of lead directly via uptake. However, lead that is bound to mineral phases in soils cannot be directly taken up by the plants. So we used a biodegradable chelating agent uh, ethylene diamine disuccinic acid or EDDS to facilitate phyto extraction by transforming soil lead from uh, various mineral bound forms to plant extractable forms, which can then be taken up by the plants. Almost 70% of the lead became phyto available uh, at an EDDS dose of 30 millimoles. Here are the results uh, from an ongoing field study in Jersey City in the first house. Uh, the lead uh, concentration went down from 800 parts per million to 500 parts per million after two EDDS doses. And in the second house, uh, it went from 1100 to 600 parts per million. Lead mostly accumulated in plant roots, which we then uh, dug up and incinerated. So to summarize, uh, this is what my group is doing uh, to combat uh, uh, water vulnerability, uh, uh, or in other words, improve water resiliency in response to climate change. Uh, our university is in New Jersey, which is located on the bank of uh, Hudson River, overlooking the spectacular Manhattan skyline. This is a view of New York City from my office. Uh, New Jersey, uh, the map here uh, shows that it's a highly urbanized coastal state on the Atlantic Ocean. See all the red, uh, these are all urban hotspots. So we are extremely vulnerable to climate change impacts. 100-year fl floods are uh, becoming more like 25-year floods now. We are getting hurricanes this far up north more frequently than anybody could have imagined merely 20, 25 years ago. To minimize the impact of these uh, flooding events on water quality, we are therefore focusing on uh, sustainable water treatment by making uh, green infrastructures capable of filtering stormwater runoff on site. We are utilizing plant-based methods to treat wastewater and recycle the spent biomass to generate bioenergy. And we are trying to return 
contaminated brownfill properties to their original conditions uh, using technologies that are sustainable from both ecological and economic perspectives. Uh, here's my uh, contact info. Uh, 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 thank you for uh, uh, attending this session. Like uh, I hear very good things from Manish about this. Uh, good luck to all, all of you and uh, please feel free to connect with me anytime. Thank you so much. I mean, you are uh, on the time and also touched upon several, several uh, aspects that, that are part of my questionnaire. So I will get back to you, uh, but I know that uh, I'm sorry to ask you to be there for a little bit more time. Uh, in the meantime, uh, all the panelists uh, finish their presentation. So next in the queue uh, is none other than our star, uh, Indian star professor, uh, Professor Dinesh Mohan. I would uh, just say that uh, he is inspiring many of uh, us and uh, for several years. And he has given me a bio sketch of really very moderate, but I found out a few of the things to be mentioned. I would uh, start with like, uh, he is uh, currently Thomas Rutier, highly cited researcher. Uh, most influential uh, scientific mind, he, uh, he was among the 1% of most influential scientific mind in 2014. Uh, that cited uh, all, all over the world, 3,000 uh, people. Uh, he owned the Obama, Obama Singh 21st Century um, the Initiative Award, Knowledge Initiative Award. He is a fellow of research, uh, the Royal Society of Chemistry. He has won his environmental awards, and, uh, but none other than these awards or recognition. What I would say is that uh, biochar. Now, whenever there is a, this word biochar comes, his one uh, review paper, I always, uh, if any of my students starts working on remediation, I say, go and read that paper. Uh, and uh, then he's surprised with uh, this 50 impact, <laughs> the chemical review paper. Uh, so, I mean, uh, keep doing it. Uh, so this is, uh, the, it is our pleasure to host him. Uh, Professor Mohan, stage is yours. Uh, I will not be presenting the work, what I am doing, but just I will show one slide that will give a flavor what uh, we are doing in our lab. But later on, I will put some questions to all of you and maybe some other experts who can come with some uh, feedback or make some comments or how to implement those technologies. So uh, in place of showing what we are doing, I will just uh, touch two or three important, uh, I think, contaminants, and we will talk about that and some of the technologies which we are using. So basically, in my lab, we are doing two, three different uh, type of work. One is related to water quality, monitoring, modeling, assessment. So this is a routine type of uh, monitoring studies. So everybody need that to have some base, basic idea about the contaminants, transport, whatever you want to say. Then our major focus is on the development of some materials, mainly uh, nanomaterials, biochars, magnetic biochars. Yes, uh, Dr. Manish is right. We have started working on the biochar in, 90, in 2005. And that was the first paper when we used that biochar in water remediation. And after that, I think we have the exponential rise and I am really good to see a lot of work is going on now in this area. But I don't know, those who are working in soil, they are not able to accept that you can use that biochar in water remediation. So a lot of things are going around. Then uh, next is we are working on the biofuels, bio refineries where we are converting the biomass into bio oil. And from bio oil, we are making some wood preservatives. We are using as a fuel. We are also doing the upgradation to the transportation fuel. So this is one of the area. And then we are also trying to have some carbon sequestration where we are putting this uh, uh, biochar into soil and uh, looking into the emission from the soil as well as the uh, improvement in the soil fertility, soil quality, hold, water holding capacity, cationic fuel capacity. So that's it, whatever we are doing. So mainly, I think, uh, uh, are working on the 
three important goals which falls under sustainable development one is the clean water second is the sustainable cities and uh, communities and climate action i think recently we have a new project is starting from the for the smart cities that is given by the pmo office so we will be starting working on that very soon in collaboration with the iit and other 30 plus institutes so i am one of the person who is uh, taking part in this project so mainly i think uh, uh, we have to focus on the decontamination of water because everybody is having some idea about the water problems associated with the contamination then then after this covid 19 pandemic how we are facing because 3 billion people worldwide they are lacking for the basic hand washing facilities so without going into the detail i think let me come to the main important agenda i want to discuss there are two things you mentioned one is the contaminant transport and second is the remediation and i think somehow we are not able to connect these two things together still if you just look into the contaminant transport we have wide variation between those who are working in the monitoring part and those who are working in the modeling so there is a significant gap between the state of the science and the use of the practice i think we need to address that similarly for the remediation uh, mainly uh, we are ending up with some good quality publications <clears throat> developing many materials absorbent nano materials then finally when you look into the papers i think many of us are making writing reviews so most of the time the papers are lacking in terms of the economic assessment and how to get into the uh, real, real waste water treatment systems then constraint of the process is scaling up then is simulation optimization then how to take to the large scale water treatment and these things are missing if you just look into the literature you will never find those objectives or the conclusions or whatever you want to see so just to give you an idea just look into the literature open the google scholar and then say absorbent for water treatment and you will be getting i think 100000 papers and more than 95% studies are only restricted to the lab it is not going to the field and that is what i think we have to work for because until unless we are not going to take those materials or technologies to the uh, end users i think publication is fine but in terms of the technology we are not going to give anything to the especially for the for uh, poor people who are not getting the drinkable water so research and development are needed to make use of the developed absorbent in real scale water treatment facilities and for this all the stakeholders including whosoever is working in this area whether monitoring modeling remediation engineers chemist uh, geochemist policy makers government bodies they must come on the same platform and try to think about how to make a good technology out of so many materials we already have in the literature now in in addition to that i just want to draw a i think uh, a point point here about the ro system and i think this is the technology we are using in india especially a lot and uh, this is a real pain nowadays because everybody is uh, having some uh, like fancy ideas that okay now this company is bringing this uh, ro system so we need to get that and put in the in the house and uh, next day you are getting the new ro system and using for the water treatment without knowing whether we really want that ro system or not because most of the time when you are uh, making the treatment using ro water 80% or more than 80% water is going into the drain without knowing whether that water is suitable or not even 
the municipal water which in Delhi we are getting is treated water. So we have to have some guidelines for the areas where we can use RO system or where we can substitute that RO with some low cost sustainable technologies. We are only knowing about the permissible or desirable limit that, okay, we should not be going beyond that. But let me make a point here that in 2004, WHO also provided a minimum levels of the required nutrients you need. Especially if I talk about the magnesium, you need a minimum of 10 milligram per liter and the optimum is about 20 to 30 milligram per liter. For calcium, you need about 20 milligram per liter and optimum is about 40 to 80 milligram per liter. But if you take in like total calcium and magnesium, it should be between two to four millimole per liter. So we are not taking into account the minimum level. We are just looking into the maximum permissible limit and whatever nutrients we have in the water, we are just clean up those uh, uh, nutrients and uh, drinking the water, which is not actually required. We can just simply use the filtration system to make the water suitable for drinking purpose. And I think in India, government is taking a serious view on this. And I think we will have some, some I think, substitute for the RO systems very soon. So many adsorbent, many materials uh, we will be uh, having in the literature and we, we can think about how to utilize that. Now come to the another important contaminant that is pharmaceuticals or emerging contaminants. And I think uh, we are lacking in terms of the standards, though among us also we are working on the removal and monitoring part, but still we are not sure how much minimum pharmaceuticals are needed means you will be getting in paper 90%, 95% remediation. So I think we need to formulate some standards for the drinking water. This is one of the important area. I think we have to work together. Though there are some standards and recently we published a review article that US FDA and European Union, they set guidelines for the environmental con concentration of the pharmaceuticals at one, and 0 0.1 milli microgram per liter. But I think we have to work in this direction a lot. So this is the second point uh, we need to discuss. Then I think, uh, let me make some point about this uh, water-based uh, epidemiology WBE. And that is, I think you will be covering in another session. But I think we have to make this popular because I am not uh, seeing a lot of debate, discussions, articles about uh, WBE, though we have a lot of papers coming in the literature. So a, st a statistical study is needed. Uh, if uh, you look, uh, you have to look for this uh, technology. And uh, I think uh, if you just uh, look into the data uh, published in different journals, based on that, no government is taking into consideration this WBE, where uh, we can see that based on this, they have predicted something in advance or they have told the uh, people that in 10 days or uh, after one month or two months, we will have the spreading. I don't know how to deal with this it means we need to work on this uh, WBE to make it most, more popular and more acceptable. Then I think, uh, uh, one important uh, uh, contaminant we have to look into is the oil spill pollution. And this is one of the important contaminants where we have to look into because uh, in US, especially if you uh, just see this slide, more than 44 major spills in US water, 982 worldwide since last 19, uh, since 1970. And because of this, uh, I think we are facing a lot of problems. There are long-term effect on marine birds population. Oil spill frequently kill marine mammals. So a lot of literature is available in the uh, in terms of the monitoring and also for the removal. 
So in fact, we developed some material, floating magnetic material. And once you have this material, you spread on the surface of the water contaminated with the oil. And then you recover this uh, material and then you can burn it. So you have the uh, energy out of the material you use for the removal of oil. So this is one of the area where I think we have to uh, work. And uh, I think uh, we are also working on this uh, uh, biochar production. So I'm not going into that detail. So I think these four important points, I was thinking to just float so that we will have the discussion on that. And I think the rest of the uh, information about my work and about my publication, I think that is available in the public domain. So with this, I think I'm done. So over thank to you. Dr. Manish. Yeah, thank you so much because uh, <clears throat> although you have taken up my questions, <laughs> I mean, the, some of the question already gone. Uh, so that is, uh, but uh, eventually that is what we need to be discussed. And it's, it's nice that you yourself has uh, recognized and thrown that question rather uh, to wait me to ask that question. <laughs> so I think uh, next speaker is, uh, I mean, I would say the Dinesh, Professor, Dinesh Mohan of Sri Lanka, <laughs> I, if I can. <laughs> Uh, so this, uh, I, it's my pleasure to invite Professor Mathika Bitanes, who is a professor at the Equestria Resilience Research Center, University of Sri Jayavardhana Pura, Sri Lanka. What can I tell? Uh, the, I mean, so many young and uh, the young scientists, young scientists in chemistry, young scientists forum, chairperson, um, and uh, so it says that uh, within the uh, short spine of her life, she has achieved a significant uh, position, at least uh, in, in general in this remediation field for sure. And in India, I think she is a top notch uh, the scientist. As uh, indicated by Presidential Award for Scientific Publication for 10 years, she also is the top most scientist uh, uh, considered by uh, the scientific uh, many SCI wow. uh, She is representing Sri Lanka in that coveted 2% of the most uh, the cited uh, scientists across the globe. And uh, her citation is just uh, uh, the going cruising uh, with 8,000 and H uh, index 40. So, uh, Metika, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Manish, for giving the floor to discuss a little bit of, uh, about uh, our work uh, back in Sri Lanka. So my focus here would be uh, regarding the municipal solid waste disposal and the water vulnerability. Um, so um, before I'm going into that uh, direction, I would like to mention some of the research work that we carry out uh, in my research group. Uh, this is the research group uh, in the photo that you can see that we were uh, going on hiking. And um, uh, our research is uh, more or less focused on a few different topics, uh, um, waste to wealth uh, research, uh, that is that we are convert, trying to convert the municipal solid waste into biochar and uh, use that biochar to treat uh, waste, uh, waste water. Uh, then there is an interesting study on chron chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology in Sri Lanka. We have a, a unique uh, issue in the dry zone of Sri Lanka. There are some uh, pockets of uh, uh, areas that uh, where we have people who having uh, kidney disease, uh, which where the, the source is uh, unknown yet. Uh, it's just like the, the arsenic uh, issue in Bangladesh, uh, where I was in the beginning. Uh, but here in this uh, chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology in Sri Lanka, it's now uh, more than uh, three decades past. Uh, still, uh, we are not, uh, you know, tackling the, uh, the correct uh, uh, the, the risk factors or correct uh, etiological factors. And uh, one of uh, our studies are on uh, pharmaceuticals and personal care products in leafy vegetables. We are trying to uh, 
uh, gather some um, plant material that we are you know eating raw or eating cooked uh, leafy vegetables uh, because these uh, leafy vegetable uh, cultivation a uh, lot of uh, manual uh, application is been done Uh, so we have a uh, worry about uh, you know whether the pharmaceuticals or personal care products are uh, going into the leafy vegetables through the manual application um then one of my favorite research uh, studies is on uh, serpentine soil research uh, serpentine soil is uh, one of the igneous uh, soils uh, made by the igneous uh, rock weathering Uh, so this serpentine soil has is rich in very uh, rich in uh, heavy metals like uh, chromium uh, nickel uh, manganese and cobalt um, so this uh, we have about four uh, to five uh, locations where we uh, this serpentine soil uh, uh, soil uh, bodies are present um, so people are you know uh, using um, ground water and surface water in these particular areas so Uh, we are trying to look at, uh, look into how serpentine uh, soil uh, releases uh, heavy metals into the environment and um, we have another study on microplastic uh, where we are looking at uh, how the uh, fate and transport of uh, different contaminants happen uh, with microplastics into water and soil so uh, today i am going to discuss about the municipal solid waste issue uh with regard to its contamination uh, of uh, waters uh, so as in the case of many developing countries uh, in sri lanka also we are having uh, uh not landfills but uh, those are open dump sites so we don't have a liner we don't have a, a cover in this uh, particular dumping areas so we are just uh, you know throwing out all the garbage into an open area um so that uh, there are a lot of uh, environmental issues almost all water air soil uh, all three spheres are polluting uh, through this particular uh, dumping issue and in the case of sri lanka we uh, have you know about uh, 7000 metric tons a day uh, of uh, waste is uh, being generating and uh, more than uh, 250 dump sites are uh, you know in all over sri lanka and all these dump sites majority is in the western province where the uh, metropolitan is and then uh, more or less uh, the the if we consider the scale of the dumps uh, it's medium and small scale dumps are the uh, most prominent but uh, we have few um, large scale dumps where this uh, the dump sliding and uh, all these damages are happening uh, so the biggest issue uh, comes up with the high rainfall that we are getting in sri lanka uh, from both uh, different you know two uh, monsoons that uh, from the uh, monsoon northwestern and the uh, um, uh, uh, southwestern uh, and the northeastern monsoon Uh, so uh, this uh, when the monsoon rainfall uh, pops up uh, into the uh, what uh, so, uh, solid waste uh, body a lot of leachate is being generated so part of the leachate is uh, you know overflowing and then uh, part is going to ground water it's uh, more importantly uh, almost all these uh, um, dump sites are located uh, close to uh, uh, surface water bodies Uh, where we have like uh, 100 over 100 uh, rivers and uh, most of these rivers along these rivers you can find uh, many uh, dump sites so a lot of pollutants are you know uh, releasing by these dump sites into the water environment so um, this is just to show you know how bad this uh, landfill leachate uh, is so this leachate is directly flowing into the environment without any treatment uh and uh, you know close by uh, surface water so you can see very high uh, bod cod and nutrient levels as well as uh, high levels of uh, toxic heavy metals also present in this uh, leachate so uh, this uh, table shows uh, different uh, you know uh, leachate uh, comparison with different dump sites uh, in the uh, in the country uh so uh, 
this uh, slide shows uh, where we are working on. Um, uh, we have uh, selected a dump site and we are now characterizing the landfill leachate. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, worked on this dump site for two years now. Uh, so we have characterized the, the leachate uh, every month and then um, uh, the leachate pollution index has been calculated. Uh, so it's very high and you can see uh, other than uh, other than uh, nutrients, uh, a lot of uh, metalloids and metals are present as well as organic fraction, a lot of uh, humic uh, matter, a lot of pulvic uh, acid and hydrophilic fraction is also uh, very high in this leachate. Um, and uh, also the volatile organic compounds, uh, you know, you all know, you all have uh, experience when you are going, um, you know, passing a waste dump site, it's very uh, smelly. Uh, bad smell is coming up because of, uh, not only because of the uh, gaseous emissions, because of the volatile organic emissions. So, high volatile organic content is being found in these uh, dump sites, same in uh, Sri Lanka as well. And other than the, the these uh, pollutants that we described, uh, there's a lot of uh, POPs, uh, persistent organic compounds, uh, like um, Professor Saka mentioned, there can be a lot of uh, PFOS, PFAS, and many other uh, pops uh, are incorporated in, uh, in you know uh, are characterized with this leachate however in sri lanka we are not in a position to uh, analyze uh, for these uh, kind of pollutants um, but uh, we will be you know trying to reach some people um, some uh, eminent scientists so that they can help us to analyze all these things so these are some of the examples from the uh, from the world uh, U.S. and uh, you know uh, other countries where they have characterized their leachate um, you know, with uh, regard to PFOS and PFAS and many other pops uh, uh, into the uh, system. So our uh, work on the carbonizing uh, part. So I think uh, you have to wind up <laughs> because okay. the two okay. other people. And, yeah. Yes. Um, uh, so we are trying to work on uh, carbonizing the bio waste into biochar and. Uh, to treat the landfill leachate using uh, those biochar, which is a, a challenging task, but uh, we are working on that particular way uh, to, you know, uh, to achieve some uh, sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. Uh, so actually, I was knowing you are going to finish. That's why I told <laughs> that please. Okay, uh, here we go. Uh, our uh, next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Diganta Bhusan Das, who is uh, like this is a kind of see the in the, the um, yeah he is uh, professor from uh, his university pronunciation is very difficult. He will tell himself, uh, but L U U K. And uh, the, he has been uh, actually in the porous medium uh, field uh, where it is permeable reactive barrier, which is a really a um, great uh, multi-phase and transport in uh, porous medium. So he is actually the, he has established this specialist group in at IWA forum. And he headed, uh, the, he was founding secretary, vice chair elect and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, he also worked as an editor and associate editor of Water Science Technology and Water Supply, that is again IWA Publishers. Uh, we did write a review, I, him, and Metika about uh, the permeable reactive barrier. I am going to be sure that some uh, his talk is going to get to be related with uh, lab to field uh, aspects. So, Diganta, uh, your seven to eight, ten minutes starts now. Manish, can you share the screen from there? I cannot yeah, do yeah. it. So by that time, so, so while yeah. it's being yeah, done, yeah, I can, hmm. yes, I can tell that uh, I am um, I'm a reader at uh, Loughborough University uh, in the UK. So Loughborough actually has this combination of word OU three times if you check. And according to English grammar, if you have OU, you can pronounce the word in different way. And Loughborough can actually be pronounced in 39 different ways. So it doesn't matter how you pronounce it. So you can't <laughs> be wrong. Okay. okay, go ahead, go ahead, Diganta. I will meet you. Yeah, largest uh, campus university in the UK. So I was just going to uh, mention uh, part of our research interest uh, where 
we, we look at how we extend some of the multi-phase uh, flow principles in porous media to carbon uh, capture and sequestration. So I'm taking your theme in the broadest context and, and taking it as, as a step forward where you can extend some of our existing knowledge uh, into CCS projects. But while we do that, we know that there are a number of limitations in the existing theories of two-phase flow in porous material, multi-phase flow in porous material. So we are looking at so this particular context, we are looking at how we can eliminate some of those gaps in knowledge and applying them, uh, particularly because when you look at CCS project, uh, human health, uh, environmental health, they are key. Uh, site monitoring is key. Site uh, estimation, they are key. So there are a number of key estimates that we need to do. So really what we are trying to do is uh, trying to estimate uh, the numbers as accurately as we can by eliminating uh, some, some limitations in the existing knowledge. So if you look at geological storage sites where they're trying to put uh, carbon uh, as uh, CO2, the number of site selection criteria. I don't think I need to look through, mention all of this. There is not enough time as well, but there are a number of uh, criteria that we need to look at. So can you go to the next slide? Now, once you have uh, identified some sort of sites, there are uh, CO2 capture mechanisms. So these are the key mechanisms that are used to capture a CO2 in a CCS sites. So if you look at the center graph, the green graph, so that's a graph uh, along with time. So left to right, time increases. So depending on what time scale you are, the, the capture mechanism is different. So if you are look at the short time scale, we'd be looking at structural trapping within the geological medium, or we might be looking at solubility trapping of CO2 being dissolved in the resident water. But if you are looking at a larger time scale, we'll be looking at capillary trapping and mineral trapping, where some of the geological uh, reactions, such as geochemical reactions become important. So CO2 then reacts with the existing minerals in the, in, in the subsurface, and then it becomes a product of some sort of geochemical reaction. So we are looking at these early time steps, structural trapping and solubility trapping, and exploring how we can extend some of the uh, two-phase flow principles into CCS uh, projects. Okay, next slide. Now in that context, the phase diagram of CO2 is very important. As you know, CO2 is a really interesting uh, liquid or a gas. It has got a number of phases. And we are really looking at that su CO2 supercritical fluid stage and possibly CO2 liquid stage as well, because you can reduce the volume of CO2 that you can inject in the, uh, in the subsurface. Uh, and so you have to maintain certain temperature, which is typically about 70, uh, four uh, degrees centigrade and uh, 35 bar, sorry, 7.3 uh, megapascal and 31 degrees centigrade. So you have to maintain certain temperature and pressure. Okay, next. So let, let me not tell you much about the phase diagram. So when you do an experiment, it could be a core scale experiment in the lab or a lab scale experiment as you, if you would call. So we can inject supercritical CO2 in a porous sample, which is a typically core, we have all the controls, we have got all the sensors, uh, and we can monitor uh, what's going on. And then we can also capture the data and then start plotting some graphs to understand what's going on. So if I go, can go to the next slide. So if you then start plotting typical uh, two-phase flow uh, diagrams, so we, we, this is what we typically do, water saturation, which is the water content in the domain and capillary pressure. So capillary pressure is the driving force uh, in this context. So capillary pressure is a function of surface tension as well. So by that, I'm stating that supercritical CO2 is not mixed with water. It stays as if it's an oil and water uh, emulsion. It stays as two different phase and uh, the two phase flow flows through the system. So if you look at the typical uh, traditional uh, uh, theories, they would typically plot the top uh, line, which is our, these are drainage curves. 
the top graph, which is a static correlation or static curve, but we would look at at a time scale uh, dynamic curve or dynamic capillary pressure curves. So the existing theories or the existing approach uses the top curve, the static correlation, and we have shown this is also published in advances in water resources. There is significant errors uh, in how we determine these correlations and hence uh, we expect uh, errors in the calculations as well for site estimates. So we need to estimate the difference between the static curve and the dynamic curve so that we can work out the true uh, holding capacity of CO2. Next slide, gone. Uh, I'm going to hurry up. So the estimates can be found out by what they call dynamic coefficient in porous materials. So we estimate them and use this coefficient uh, in our estimates. Next. So by using dynamic correlations, uh, we can then work out the CO2 saturations in a sample uh, or in a, in a geological formation. So these are all published uh, papers, but let me not uh, dwell too much on this. So we can work out the uh, gas and CO2 and water content in the domain. Okay, next. Now in this context, what is important is actually to see if there is any CO2 leakage uh, for regulatory purpose. Uh, so that's something we do. So we have got number of techniques for that. So one of the techniques we use is membrane-based sensor. These are uh, in-house sensors that we can develop where we use membrane as a uh, diaphragm uh, to do flux measurements. Next. So we use uh, gas flux principles, uh, but we use geothermal uh, gradients. So as you know, as you uh, go down, the temperature increases, the pressure increases. So by depending on the geothermal gradient, we do these measurements at different temperature and pressure. Okay, next slide. And these are the typical response we'll get from sensors. The pressure uh, increases with time. And so these are basically curves for uh, calibrating sensors while we develop them. So understanding what uh, response you get and by knowing that we can work out, uh, back calculate how much CO2 is there uh, at, at that particular point. The next slide, just a couple of slides uh, more then I'll be done. Next one. So the other aspect that's very important is actually to know uh, uh, in terms of point measurements, the relationship between CO2 uh, and the properties of the soil. So we are using a geological, uh, geoelectrical properties or electrical properties of the soil. So all materials have some sort of electric properties, membranes, soils. Uh, so what we are trying to do here is measure the electrical properties of the soil in this context and understand how uh, the CCS project could be monitored in terms of leakage and possibly storage as well. Okay, next slide. Just one graph, uh, just to make that point. And we can use any materials we like. So we can use silica, uh, basalt, or other uh, carbonate uh, rocks as well. So irrespective of the material, of course, the response will be different. And we have seen that the response from the sensors are different, different depending on the material. So we need to understand these responses from the sensors. Okay, next slide. And the key issue here, the, where, what's key here, the unique USP, unique selling point for us is that the sensors uh, have been designed by looking at both uh, measurements of electrical uh, conductivity and dielectric permittivity. So we do uh, both measurements, simultaneous measurements of uh, electrical conductivity and dielectric permittivity. And that seemed to give us much better understanding or confidence uh, in, in terms of how the sensors are working. So this graph, just some typical graph where we are looking at how a saline aquifer uh, respond to these uh, types of sensors. Okay, next slide. So I'm almost done, Manish. So that's the last slide. Thanks for uh, listening. And what I wanted to basically convey uh, is the message that we are looking at dynamic capillarity and the coefficient uh, that's key for CCS projects. Uh, and of course, flux that we have developed for uh, flux measurements and, uh, and point measurements in the case of CCS project. And that's- Thank all you, uh, Diganta. Actually, 
uh, whenever I meet him, I remember Assam, uh, where I spend so much time, and uh, his voice is also, I mean, brings that air. And uh, uh, Professor Mohan and I was uh, smiling that after saying thank you for listening, he still says no. <laughs> that uh, the, those things. So ah, I learned that uh, that uh, the aspect. Uh, some panelist is <laughs> I don't know that how. Uh, so. Thank you very much, Diganta. The last speaker of this uh, one, I know that he is going to wrap uh, the very soon, and then we will go to the uh, this one. I am surprised to see that uh, all the speaker that was invited are centurion. Uh, all have the hundred plus uh, uh, the paper. So unless I go through the Bine uh, sketch, I found that he also has the hundred plus. So this is a uh, kind of century club. Um, and uh, so he has been uh, the, the faculty at Lancaster in uh, the Environment Center at uh, UK again. Uh, and uh, the, he, he, he was associate editor of Journal of Clays and Clays Mindels, editorial board member of a critical reviews in environmental science and technology, which is very reputed journal. And uh, his work uh, on clay minerals uh, for contaminant remediation is uh, has generated uh, a, a international patent, and uh, so Bine, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Professor Manish. Uh, am I audible, and can you see my slide? Yes, I can see your beautiful red slide, and you are audible. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, um, I probably don't have much uh, time left for this session now, but uh, I would begin by uh, thanking. Uh, Professor uh, Manish and Professor David Warner for uh, inviting me to this uh, uh, forum, uh, to this plenary session, where I am actually uh, sharing the platform with some of the very eminent scientists in the field, and some of which I have been following since my uh, PhD days. Uh, so it is a real privilege uh, uh, to uh, see uh, some of you uh, at this uh, plenary session. And especially, uh, uh, I have been collaborating with uh, some of you, uh, uh, for example, Professor uh, Bitanis, uh, since many years now. Uh, so it's, it's a real pleasure. And uh, yeah, I should also mention that very recently, I have been, uh, it has been an opportunity to involve with Professor Mohan as well as a co-author in one of the publications. So, um, yeah, uh, I will just uh, try to give you a flavor of uh, the research work that I have been doing with my PhD students and myself, which is about role of engineered minerals in achieving sustainable development goals. Now, uh, our work mainly uh, revolves around minerals and other particulate uh, materials. Uh, for example, um, the uh, clay minerals and then uh, uh, nanoparticles, biochar, and there are various applications, including carbon capture, soil remediation, water treatment, and crop production as well, and do some uh, environmental uh, biogeochemistry works uh, looking at the fate and transport of uh, contaminants. Also, uh, very recently, I have been uh, uh, starting to uh, engage in some research about micro and nanoplastics with some collaboration and with one of my uh, very newly starting uh, PhD students. So I, uh, our research um, uh, pinpoint three aspects, climate change, environmental health, and uh, food security aspects. And basically, I, uh, we try to understand the biophysical chemical phenomena occurring at the surface and interface of mineral and other particulate materials. And carbon dioxide capture and sequestration in soil that has been a, a primary part of my research last uh, at least five years. Um, um, I will show some example about that and obviously the remediation uh, of uh, emerging and conventional contaminants using uh, mineral based or biochar materials. So let me start begin uh, uh, with the uh, mineral application for carbon capture, carbon dioxide capture. Uh, so th this photo actually was uh, taken from the um, uh, uh, Guardian, where one of our recently published paper in Nature was highlighted. So this paper is about enhanced weathering, uh, which uh, some of you might know that it is an United Nations recognized carbon dioxide removal approach. And in this approach, 
uh, what we suggest is uh, you apply crushed rock material, for example, basalt for growing your crops, like you apply fertilizers to your soil. And then what happens, this rock along with aqueous uh, carbon dioxide, it reacts uh, with the minerals, uh, which is known as weathering reaction. And due to this weathering reaction, different types of cations, for example, calcium, magnesium, uh, bicarbonate, anions, and silicic acid, these are produced. And these cations and these bicarbonate anions, they uh, move or migrate into the soil profile. They reach into the nearby stream or they reach into the groundwater. Ultimately, they find their way into the ocean. And in the ocean, these bicarbonate anions or calcium or magnesium cations, they can precipitate as calcium carbonate, which is known to be a permanent sink of uh, carbon in the earth system. So the carbon dioxide that was primarily drawn down from the atmosphere can be sequestered in the floor, ocean floor. And some of those carbon materials can be incorporated in the oceanic organisms as well. So uh, uh, scientists say that this is one of the um, a permanent sink or permanent sequestration of um, uh, carbon dioxide, atmospheric carbon dioxide. And in, in this whole uh, process, um, there is a big benefit to the uh, soil as well because it supplies the nutrients elements, it supplies the micro macronutrients, it supply, it reduces um, uh, 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 the soil acidity, etc. So this is uh, the paper that we have been able to publish in Nature recently. And here, by uh, mathematical calculations, we have shown that uh, China, India, USA, Brazil, these major countries, they have the potential to uh, sequester carbon dioxide from 0.5 to 2 gigatons uh, per year uh, with the extraction cost of approximately 80 to 180 ton per US dollar per ton. So which is comparable or sometimes even uh, less expensive than some of the existing uh, carbon capture and sequestration methods. And uh, the interesting part of this is, uh, is not only the rock material, pure rock material, but some other industrial uh, waste materials can also be applied given they are safe from secondary contaminations, for example, heavy metals. So as I mentioned very briefly before, there are several co-benefits of this uh, carbon capture and um, uh, soil carbon sequestration, increased yield, uh, and uh, all those stuffs. So here again, we we published, uh, we summarized these core benefits in a couple of papers. One is in nature, uh, nature plants, another one is in advances in agronomy. So second topic is about the uh, clay minerals. Uh, so uh, this has I have been working on this clay mineral site uh, since my PhD days. Um, so clay minerals can be modified by different means. Uh, you can produce organo clay, pillar clay, uh, you can make a clay polymer composites, etc. And by doing this, you actually change the properties of these clay minerals, which are suitable for different types of applications, uh, including sorption of organic or inorganic contaminants. Some of these materials, modified materials, you can even use in the permeable reactive barriers. And um, uh, uh, you can uh, combine them with microorganisms. Um, and we have uh, uh, one of our work has uh, generated a patented material for uh, removing phenolic contaminants from water. And we have published a series of papers uh, by demonstrating the different types of modified clays, uh, for example, organo clay, uh, uh, the uh, redox modified clay, uh, which aren't as a, a publication in environmental science and technology. Uh, and then some zeolite material we have uh, modified uh, for removing uh, gaseous contaminants and um, pillared clay uh, for removing heavy metals and etc. Another interesting part is uh, the clay bacterial interaction that we have looked in. Um, uh, and we know that uh, clay minerals uh, or different types of minerals, they are naturally present in the soil and they can be modified as well. Now, can we modify the clay minerals which can support better growth of microorganisms and that microorganisms then can eat on the uh, organic contaminants. So in this way, we can get two benefits. One is adsorption, which is the um, uh, concentration of contaminants on a particle surface. And then if that particle itself harbor the microorganisms, uh, which can eat on that contaminants, then we get the complete remediation, adsorption plus degradation. And based upon this hypothesis, 
we have been able to show in different um, uh, 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 publications that uh, not only directly remediating organic contaminants, for example, polycyclic um, aromatic hydrocarbons, this can work uh, in case of uh, mixed contaminant scenarios as well. For example, we have a contamination, co-contamination with cadmium and uh, uh, phenanthrin. In that case, the cadmium, if we apply microorganisms to remediate it, the cadmium gives toxicity to the microorganisms and cadmium kill the microorganisms. But if we can develop or design a clay mineral which can reduce the toxicity of cadmium or immobilize cadmium and harbor the phenanthrin degrading microorganisms better, then we get the successful remediation of phenanthrin in uh, slurry, in soil slurry, in aqueous environment, in uh, contaminated long-term contaminant soil, uh, et cetera. So this again, we have demonstrated in, demonstrated in several publications. Another uh, area I will very uh, briefly uh, uh, mention here is the clay nanocomposite materials. Uh, as Professor Mohan has mentioned that uh, magnetic materials, which is very useful, we can produce magnetic materials uh, with clay minerals as well. For example, here um, uh, is the TEM uh, image of peligroskite modified with magnetite uh, uh, nanoparticles. Uh, here is haloisite, nanomartic, uh, uh, haloisite nanoparticle, which is a collaborative work with one of Professor uh, Bithanes students. Uh, clay uh, and carbon nanomaterial, graphite carbon nanomaterials, clay carbon nanotube materials, and clay zero valent iron nanomaterials that can be again applied for various contaminants remediation. Now, I think uh, by this brief uh, discussion today, I have been able to give you uh, or convince you to some extent that these clay minerals or different types of minerals can be used to uh, uh, achieve uh, multiple sustainable development goals. For example, zero hunger because the rock dust application that can increase the uh, crop production, crop yield, uh, while uh, uh, directly working on the climate action because it removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, clean water and sanitation, obviously, we are removing contaminants, uh, including pathogenic contaminants uh, in, uh, in, the, in the water system uh, and life on land. Because if we can remove contaminants, if we can remediate contaminants from the soil or in water, we obviously increase uh, the uh, biodiversity uh, of our planet Earth. Some of our, uh, some of the, some of my current PhD students, uh, uh, like one of them, is working on cement bypass dust for carbon capture in the soil. Also looking at the uh, heavy metal uh, dynamics in that uh, uh, um, uh, amended soil. Uh, Samani, uh, she has just recently joined from Sri Lanka. One of uh, Professor Medica's students. She will be working on microplastic in agricultural soil, bioavailability and bioaccessibility of microplastic driven. Uh, contaminants. Uh, Amy uh, is still working at University of Sheffield, where I was working before. She is working on enhanced rock weathering and soil carbon uh, sequestration. And I have a couple of students uh, that I am co-supervising at University of Newcastle in Australia with Professor Nancy Bolan, uh, who are working on phytoremediation on petroleum hydrocarbons and uh, nutrient values of uh, biochar. So I think this is all about uh, my uh, uh, topics that I wanted to uh, share with you today. Uh, and again, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Manish, and um, uh, for inviting me uh, to this uh, uh, plenary session. I think that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, actually, um, there are so many interesting things and uh, the, all the panelists, I knew that uh, this remediation contaminant uh, the theme, uh, the collection of the speakers were such that my questions gone all, all are answered in fact. But uh, still for the sake and uh, because uh, the new uh, session, I intentionally we kept uh, three people there so, so that we can have some uh, flexible time here. But nevertheless, we want to finish in 10 minutes. I have only five questions. And uh, I will take uh, that five questions anybody can take up and sometimes uh, the or sometimes I can uh, be direct to that. One is about um, the, just to make the people understand is that many times a, as a listener that contaminant at, at itself, 
how, of course, legacy and emerging. Uh, there is a, some this classification, but there are so many emerging comes PPCPs, PFOS, uh, the so and so forth. That uh, the how you people wants to classify them or try to approach a uh, contaminants from the environmental and health perspective, whether there is any toxicological input to our approach uh, or it is like we saw the opportunity that it, for this contaminant we can have the more publication or the uh, high impact publications. So I would go with uh, the Professor Sarkar first because uh, it, uh, he has been answering many questions. So let's uh, start this one also. I'm not sure I understood your question, uh, Manish. Like uh, uh, emerging contaminants have nothing to do with uh, publication impacts, you know? Like uh, it's basically, uh, it depends on like, uh, in, in the US, EPA has classified some of the legacy contaminants by coming up with maximum contaminant limits. In many cases, like uh, uh, these other contaminants which have a very serious toxicological profile, they haven't been actually regulated by EPA. You know, so from that angle, we call them emerging because they have not been regulated. So uh, there is no limit for what, like uh, uh, how much you can actually pollute although it's not the right way of doing things, of course, but again, uh, the government doesn't have any regulatory authority over that. So from that angle, we call certain contaminants, emerging contaminants because they have not been regulated. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is uh, really nice to uh, understand for even many questions I am putting to make, the, make it clear for uh, the audience. But the point here, uh, the basic point that I am interested in to know that how the environmental uh, scientists or engineers approach the contaminant. Uh, Professor Mohan, I mean, uh, how can we think that, okay, now this is the problem here? Because uh, the, what I have seen that in a given field, many times like in a Delhi groundwater, it is just a matter of determination what we want to find and we will find them because they are so heavily polluted. So how to approach uh, if a given contaminated site is there that which contaminants needs to be addressed together or whether we can address multi-contaminants at one point, uh, the, I mean, the solution. Uh, unmute, sir. What Professor Sarkar told, I think he's right, means emerging means you don't have the limits, you don't have the proper, uh, I think, guidelines. So that is why that is under the category of emerging contaminants. But I think as far as the Contaminants are concerned. I don't know what, what you mean. Like, what are the contaminants we have to take into account? Or I don't yeah, know. It, it, For example, it, it, microplastic. If you take microplastic, or you will find many papers in the literature, but still, it is not uh, clear whether uh, you have some toxic effect or not. Means the toxicity. So, so I don't know how to deal with that situation. But it's still you are getting a lot of papers, you are getting a lot of reports about that, but there is no report where you will find that this microplastic is having this toxic or toxic. Yeah, very, very well so, said. Actually, the very, very pertinent uh, the example, because I also wrote about that and it is about that, how many contaminants microplastic is associated with rather than microplastic itself is causing any problem. Uh, Binay, you wanted to say something. Yes. Um, uh, thank you. And I, I agree with uh, Professor Sarkar and Professor Mohan, both of them, uh, regarding the uh, emerging contaminants. This is simply that we do not have any uh, regulated uh, threshold value for them. We do not know whether uh, they, for example, microplastics, they really cause any uh, no, my, health... my point is that let's suppose that in a given, uh, given uh, site, I have arsenic or some uh, uh, the iron problem, and I have this PFOS problem or microplastic problem or uh, any. So, so whether I should be worried about this emerging one, which has no guideline, or I should be worrying about those, uh, the legacy one, which are already listed. So, I, and how to approach them? Yes. Um, yeah, I was coming to that point, actually. is really, really important. And that is, I think, one aspect of current environmental science and engineering research is lacking. We need to focus more and more on mixed contaminated site. We need to, because almost nowhere you find a contaminated uh, site 
uh, contaminated soil or contaminated water that is just contaminated with one single uh, toxic element or, or compound. For example, in, in one of our research, we knew that the bacteria or the clay will work on phenanthrin, but we added intentionally uh, some cadmium in there because we know that in real world situation where we find phenanthrin contamination, for example, a previous gas work site or somewhere, there would be some heavy metals. And there, the bioremediation approach will not simply yeah, yeah. work. So yeah, yeah. That's, that is we can show in a publication yeah. that, uh, oh, mm -hmm. our, our microorganisms or our material works fantastic for uh, remediating phenanthrin. But mm -hmm. if we do not consider the mixed contamination scenario there, then it's yeah, just that a paper. Is, that is what actually I wanted to make a point, And thankfully, you all come together to say it. Uh, before Ritkar Diganta come, I will put my second question. Uh, the, about like one is that remediation, it means removing uh, or uh, trying to, uh, but how about the perspective is there about changing the fate, changing the, continue, uh, the toxicity, ch changing the type, making it uh, like, like, like Mithika was telling waste to resource. I mean, uh, the how much focus and those things are uh, there. So, I mean, remediation is one part, but remediation, how about the changing, whether that includes this or part of this, how do you see it? Uh, maybe Mithika and Diganta can go yeah. first. Yeah. Let Mithika go first, then I will yeah, say Yeah, that's true, you know. Uh, yes. I don't think we can remove anything from the environment. It's so only uh, what we can do is uh, change in the face or changing it to the face. Um, that's all we can do. So it is definitely, uh, we can't remove anything from the environment. It's only changing the face into something else or you know, uh, reducing the toxicity um, by uh, doing you know, some modification. That's all we can do. Diganta? Yes, I, I would add to that, but for me, the source of the pollutant is uh, very important. And then we know that the approach, uh, often we don't know what pollutant is there, but we don't know how to link it with the source. And there are actually what you call receptor modeling, where you basically go backward and find out what source it is. Uh, that is important uh, to me. Uh, and it also goes back to what Ma Manish was asking. So I would approach a particular problem with identifying the source. Uh, then if you look at the remediation, it's not about doing something at the site, actually doing something with the source as well, if you can uh, identify identifying it. And of course, monitoring is so important because I'm interested in monitoring aspect. Uh, so the monitoring aspect and continuous monitoring uh, of the site. I know it's not always possible, but that's very important. So we need really a number of things uh, to be done simultaneously, not one thing at a time, really. So actually this leads to the, my third question. I will not ask the, all the four questions. This is uh, maybe just uh, uh, this one and then last. Uh, the, this leads to the reverse mechanism. I mean, if something has led to the uh, release of that contaminant to the environment, something can reverse it back. And that's what uh, the, uh, where the uh, knowledge of geochemistry like Professor Sarkar or uh, actually there are two Sarkar, uh, the <laughs> Vinay and uh, the Devendra uh, had already presented and where other uh, multi-phase and those technical technology can come in the picture. So how much do you think that that knowledge can help us to put the contaminant back into the where it was. Uh, uh, the first. Well, uh, let me answer the previous question uh, first, like the way I see it. Uh, you know, like uh, we basically, like again, like we have to work together. It's uh, it's just like uh, environmental problems are as such. Uh, you know, like uh, when I was young, I read this uh, poem by Jeffrey. Uh, Sachs, uh, probably like some of the younger colleagues probably never did that, uh, that uh, otherwise it would be that seven uh, blind men or six blind men, like describing an elephant, elephant. you know, like, uh, you know, like the fate is such that you cannot remediate anything without knowing which form you are actually tackling. 
Okay, so like, again, I will give you a very simple example, like uh, for arsenic, you know, arsenic three is the toxic one, arsenic three is the more soluble one. So uh, what do we typically do? We basically convert it to arsenic five, which is basically like, again, less soluble and then get arsenic five adsorbed on materials and remove the, like, uh, 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 that material. You know, so like, again, without knowing the fate, we cannot get into or plan a proper remedial design. You know, and to uh, come back to uh, your next question, reverse engineering, that is always going to be there. You know, like, again, my issue is like, not compartmentalize those, but actually look at it as a whole. You know, a single singularity is basically like what we need by actually like, again, like uh, having people with multiple expertise coming together and working together and tackling different parts. You know, the sum of uh, 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 the individual parts are more than what a whole, like the entire uh, system can produce. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, his uh, answer is so complete that uh, I would uh, take the next question to Professor Mohan, and then we can have the last uh, the advice to our listener and from this field about the future perspective. Where do you think that this, because there are many environmental scientists and engineers who are fighting for job and who are uh, the, even uh, have the expertise, they understand the contaminant. How do you think that the, in, the uh, scope of entrepreneurship, because of course, Professor Mohan particularly has uh, tried to uh, develop a lot of biochar and uh, Bine paper are also saying that they can create new material. Metika is uh, running his own center so how much a scope is there as a market, as an entrepreneur site, as a scope for young, young people? The scope of what? A scope of being a, a environmental consultant or being a like this kind of uh, the prepare new oh, okay. uh, do the remediation thing, understand okay. this field. So, so that is what I told in the beginning and Professor Sarkar told that you should not keep yourself alone means if you are saying geochemist or chemist, I don't see any reason that you are dividing that. Means if you have to work for remediation, the chemist cannot design, only engineers can do that. Engineers cannot do the uh, chemistry. That I'm sure nowadays what is going on, I have seen many publications where those people who have not even the basic idea about the chemistry, they are making some schematic and saying this is the mechanism. They are not able to differentiate what is the difference between mechanism and schematic. So until unless you have the group where you have engineers, chemists, they must come together and design something, I think you have enough scope. Like in environmental sciences, especially those like in, in India, they are not uh, having any course where they will be either uh, getting into the into the details of chemistry or the geology or the biology means they will be getting superficial information but actually when you want to work for the design i think you have to have the chemistry background you have to have the geology background you have to have the biology background say you develop biochar then you design a system then once you have the design, then how to dispose that? And then you have to go for the recycling if possible. So you need the expertise from all the compartments. I think I agree what uh, Professor Sarkar told in the beginning. But uh, as far as the scope is concerned, I don't know, like uh, especially for biochar, lot of work is going on. And uh, I think there are many experts who are putting a lot of pressure, especially in US, to keep that on the top priority. And I think there was a week uh, we called Biochar Week. We celebrated last, uh, I think, last month. I think many of you have participated. And they were talking about that, that we have to bring that on the top agenda. But in US, it is going far ahead, means you can buy the biochar from the market commercially going for that. I think they are also getting some subsidies. There are many companies, they are getting some subsidies, but India, I think we have to work for that. We are and not I, having uh, so popular, the, we are not having mm -hmm. so many industries, though we have this system. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, this is, uh, I have seen that in the UK also, they are trying to put the biochar apply on the roadside. Uh, Professor yeah. Devendu Sarkar has also told a lot of applications. And uh, yeah. So, I mean, uh, of course, just on this question, what uh, the Professor Mohan answered, any of you want to say something? Yeah, Vinay. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, uh, th uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Manish. It's like uh, I fully agree with Professor uh, Mohan. And I just want to add that in, in India, like, uh, uh, if, like it's, it's time now to compare between countries, uh, for example, uh, two uh, upcoming economic superpowers, China and India. So I just wanted to make a point in that respect that if we look at China, their industrial growth and uh, uh, recent boom, it has come at a cost, at a significant cost of their environment. Uh, like uh, probably not all information uh, we know, uh, but the amount of information that is available from that we can say, uh, they have undergone a significant uh, uh, damage to the environment. Now, the same development is starting to begin in, 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 in India. And we cannot afford to, uh, or we, we should not afford uh, to yeah, deteriorate our afford, environment we should not do that. Yeah. For, for that cost. And for that reason, like the, uh, as Professor Mohan said, the education, like from the very beginning undergraduate courses and everything, and we need entrepreneurship in the, in the environmental sector. Like, for example, uh, most of us, we want to be a professor. So if we can change that attitude that I want to open a company to remediate the environment. So that kind of, I think, managerial or entrepreneurship development is also needed. Yeah, but Thank now you. I think yeah. things are changing in India also. So you can uh, start with some small startup and take the company. But let me give you one data, uh, I think one number. If you just look into the global biochar market, it is estimated to reach about 653 million by 2024. And you know what is the CAGR? That is about 16%. So is, uh, I think uh, you have very good market and uh, I think we have to work in different compartment, not only for soil, biochar for water, biochar for different applications, biochar for, I think, maybe decontamination of water. So I think you can start. Yeah, what what uh, yeah, I would like to just uh, say is that, uh, I mean, the conclude or summarize the whatever the input from you guys is that uh, the, and that's what message I wanted to give the young participant whose question I could not take it. Uh, Professor Devendra Sarkar tried to answer some of them. Uh, but uh, the point is that it is not necessarily uh, the need to have an academic position. If you have an interdisciplinary understanding, and uh, like Professor Mohan told that you can gather your friends who is from chemistry, who is from this one and that one, and you can certainly help not only the environment. Cleaning plastic bottle from some places is not, this is environmentalism. It is not environmental engineering. If you want to come up, you can create a job. You can create a job for yourself. You can create uh, the many changes. And uh, the government will come uh, and in support. And you will get the funding. Because now even funding agency like uh, Bill Gates Foundation or the, some uh, other things are coming that, that can give you the encouragement needed. And like Professor Mohan told that a startup. And Mythica is one of the example also. And uh, I think, and all of us can come together and help or, or like that. But of so, course, we should not see it in isolation. And that is what the, is the message that everything, we should not like, okay, I will be only biochar or I will be only the reverse engineering or the contaminant. And even fit and transport was told that it is the two sides of the same coin. So with this, uh, I would like to thank you all. And of course, I would uh, the, try to send some uh, the token of appreciation. But uh, the thank you very much for coming here with a very, very short notice. And uh, I am really, really obliged and uh, thankful to your uh, great show. And that's why I didn't mind that 30 minutes we have oversold, but it's fine. We will manage it. Thank you so much. <laughs>